What up, science geeks? Once again, we are confronted with a situation where you're learning from a video. You have the choice of revising your equilibria and reversible reactions using this video or not. I'll leave that entirely up to you. But this video starts halfway through the PowerPoint, which is attached to the email. And it's to talk about changing the conditions in dynamic equilibrium. The reason I sent you the whole PowerPoint is very simple. It goes into what reversible reactions are and dynamic equilibrium. So if you need to recap any ideas about reversibility or dynamic equilibrium, you can open the PowerPoint and go through it yourself. Assuming you're comfortable with the idea of dynamic equilibrium and reversible reactions, then we will begin. Last lesson, we touched briefly on the idea of changing conditions, for example, um, increasing temperature, increasing pressure, something like that. And that will um, have an effect on the equilibrium. Whenever a change is made to a reversible heat reaction, in a state of dynamic equilibrium, we know that the equilibrium will shift and try and oppose that change. So if I increase the temperature, if you have a state of dynamic equilibrium and you increase the temperature, you're increasing the amount of thermal energy in that system then the equilibrium will go in the direction of the reaction that will take heat in. So it will try and absorb the heat, take the heat away, and counteract the change of that system. It's trying to re-establish, that means get back to, the state of dynamic equilibrium. Concentration is how many particles of a substance you have in that container. And if you increase the concentration, then the equilibrium needs to counteract that change. It needs to oppose, go against the change. So if you increase the concentration of something on one side of the reaction, then the equilibrium will shift in the direction that produces less of that substance to oppose the change, to go against what you just did to it. The same with pressure. If you increase the pressure, then that produces uh, an increase in pressure on particles and they try and get rid of the pressure. Sometimes the only way they can get rid of the pressure is to shift the equilibrium in the direction that produces less gas. So it shrinks the total volume and undoes that change. It's always trying to oppose. That means go against the change that you've made. All reactions that are exothermic in one direction have to be endothermic in the other direction. So if the temperature is increased, then the equilibrium shifts to get rid of the temperature and it will go in the endothermic direction. So what do you think will happen if you decrease the temperature? Well, of course, the temperature will um, be lower. So to oppose the lower temperature, the reaction will shift in a direction that's exothermic to release energy into the system and warm it up again. It'll go in the exothermic direction. Looking at this uh, example here, nitrogen dioxide is in constant equilibrium with dinitrogen tetroxide. Doesn't matter about the reagents. You don't even need to know this exact equation, but it's a very common one. It could even be one of the questions on page 130. The forward reaction is exothermic and the backwards reaction is endothermic. Here's the equation for the reaction. And if you increase the temperature, what's going to happen? Remember, read the question. The forward reaction is exothermic and the backwards reaction is endothermic. You've increased the temperature. That means put thermal energy in. Are you going to drive it in the exothermic direction or the endothermic direction? The equilibrium will shift to decrease the temperature. Remember, it's trying to oppose the change. So it will go in the endothermic direction, which is to the left. If you look left, that's the nitrogen dioxide side. So it means more nitrogen dioxide will be produced. If the temperature is de decreased, then more nitrogen tetroxide will be produced because it wants to create more energy, or can't create energy, produce more energy the reaction will warm it up again. It's opposing the change. 
Change in the concentration of a substance affects the equilibrium of reversible reactions, which are in solutions. And remember, solutions is just a very fancy name of saying stuff dissolved in something. Solutions, you know, salty water is a solution. Sugary water is a solution. Ribena is a solution. Yeah, okay, anyway. Um, increasing the concentration of a substance, and let's use an arbitrary example, substance A, will, incre will mean the equilibrium doesn't want you to have an increase in the substance A. So the equilibrium will then react in such a way to decrease the amount of substance A. It's very obstinate. Doesn't want to do, doesn't really want to have that change. Decreasing the concentration of substance A upsets the equilibrium again. And so the reaction equilibrium shifts in a way to produce more of substance A. Let's look at this idea. Bismuth oxychloride. Bismuth chloride reacts in water to produce a white precipitate of bismuth oxychloride and hydrochloric acid. Here is the equation. Note the reversible sign. What will happen if more water is added? Remember, in a state of dynamic equilibrium, a system will react to oppose the change. So it'll try and undo adding more water. So how could it get rid of the water? The equilibrium will shift to decrease the amount of water, and that's to the right. So it takes the water, reacts it, and gets rid of it. So it makes more bismuth oxychloride and hydrochloric acid. If water is removed, then more bismuth chloride and water will be produced if I was to take the water away. So the reaction can go both ways because it's reversible. Let's give you another one. Let's look at chlorine gas reacting with iodine chloride and it produced iodine trichloride. Here's the equation again. Chlorine reacted with iodine chloride to make iodine trichloride into the state of equilibrium. Now, I've got chlorine being pale green and iodine chloride being brown. Iodine trichloride happens to be yellow. This could be an indicator. This could be a clue, couldn't it? What will adding more chlorine, look on the left-hand side, have on the colour of the mixture? It's in a state of equilibrium. You want to add more, you add more chlorine, and on adding more chlorine, the equilibrium is going to shift to oppose that change. It will get rid of that chlorine. What's going to happen? It will become more yellow onto the side to oppose the change. To get rid of the chlorine, the equilibrium will go to the right. It gets rid of the chlorine, the extra chlorine you put in, to re-establish its position. If I took some chlorine away, what would happen to the colour? Think about it. It'll become more brown. It won't become more pale green, because pale green is the pale colour. Brown is the dominant colour here, isn't it? So you could say it'll become more brown, or greeny brown, but definitely more brown. Because you've taken some of the chlorine away, and so it'll make more chlorine to oppose the change that you did, taking chlorine away. And it'll make more. Look at the effect of pressure. Changing the pressure has an effect on the equilibrium involving gases. If the pressure is increased, equilibrium shifts to decrease the pressure. Equilibrium shifts in the direction of fewest molecules. If the pressure is decreased, equilibrium shifts to increase the pressure, which means equilibrium shifts in the direction of most molecules. So it will take up more space to re-establish the pressure, to make the pressure come back. Let's look at an example, nitrogen dioxide. In constant equilibrium with dinitrogen tetroxide again, this is a familiar example, two molecules of nitrogen dioxide react to form one molecule of dinitrogen tetroxide. Now the numbers here are important. Two molecules react to form one molecule. Think about which one's going to take up more space, two molecules or one molecule. Here's the equation. 
If the pressure is increased, what's going to happen? Well, the equilibrium will shift to reduce the number of molecules. So it will go to the right, where there's only one molecule. One molecule is going to take up less space and reduce the pressure. So that means more of the dinitrogen tetroxide will be produced. If you decrease the pressure, then it'll go the other way to oppose the change. If you decrease the pressure, it'll want to reinforce the pressure by making more particles. The only way it can do that is by splitting apart again and going back towards the, di uh, the nitrogen dioxide. Now, if you've got a copy of this PowerPoint, you can pause the video here because the next set of activities are quite interesting. You can complete the sentences about dynamic equilibrium just to confirm that you understand it. There are arrows on the left and right of the screen which are interactive. Have a little go. Now we're going to talk about the Harper process. Ammonia is a hugely important chemical and it's used for everything from cleaning fluids to floor waxes and fertilizer. Um, it was discovered originally by Fritz Haber and is nicknamed, or named I suppose formally now, the Haber process. And it's a reversible reaction, which is why it's mentioned here. Well, what's the problem? You get nitrogen, it's not very reactive, to react with hydrogen, which is a little bit more reactive, to make ammonia. But look at the sign, look at the arrow, it's reversible. This is another good place to pause the video. Ammonia is produced in the harbour process, and this is a good opportunity for you to play with the animation to see how it, uh, how it works. Once you've had a play, come back to this video. The amount of product made in a reaction is sometimes called the yield, and is usually expressed in a percentage. For example, the yield of ammonia made in the harbour process depends on two things, temperature and pressure. This will go back to a little bit of your collision theory, talking about particles colliding together. So the yield, the amount of product you make, depends on how much temperature and pressure um, there are when you are carrying out the reaction. The highest yield of ammonia is theoretically produced by using a low temperature and a high pressure. But they don't actually use the theoretically perfect values. And this seems like a bad idea. Obviously, if you're going to make the most product which you want to sell, you want the most of it. So you want to use the theoretically best conditions, low temperature and high pressure. Why do you think they don't do that? Well, lowering the temperature slows down the rate of reaction. If you remember your collision theory, particles have to collide with enough energy to overcome the activation energy of the reaction. At low temperature, what happens to the speed of particles? Well, the speed of particles goes down because they're cooler. That means they don't collide with enough kinetic energy to react in the first place. That means it'll take too long for ammonia to be made if it's too cold. Even though it make a lot of it, It'll take forever to be made. Increasing the pressure means stronger, more expensive equipment is needed. And this is a classic exam question. And you have to explain stronger, more expensive equipment is needed for high pressure. This increases the cost of producing the ammonia. So, as always, businesses have to make a compromise. And compromise is a real big mark getting thing to say whenever you talk about the harbour process of making ammonia. And this will come up in the exam. You have to study the Harbour process because it is typical of um, a reversible reaction and it's got many different types of questions you can ask. They're all about equilibrium. So make sure you spend some time being familiar with the Harbour process. You can pause the video here and have some go at the interactive activities you can have a go at looking at the effect of temperature and pressure using the sliders on one of the slides at the bottom right hand side. And you can also look at the conditions used in the harbour process. I found this bit 
particularly interesting because it gives you the graph of the different temperatures and different pressures. And then it gives you the conclusion, which is why the temperature is used, which is this one, 450 degrees and 200 atmospheres. This maximizes the ammonia yield, but minimizes production time and costs. Compromise and knowing these figures are the key things you need to learn about this process. So, without overly expensive equipment and a rate that's fast enough, the important thing to consider is your total cost, and therefore, yield is important, but there are other costs. Expensive equipment, heating it up, and all that good stuff are also important. But don't forget, they also have to pay for the energy they put in, the wages, the raw materials. They could all be asked as questions. They're the common sense type answers you'd be expected to provide. Not the sort of stuff you can really revise for. Well, there's something else that you can do to just make your profitability that much more. You can use a catalyst. Now, a catalyst doesn't change where the equilibrium is. It just helps it get there quicker. Because, remember, a catalyst provides an alternative route with a lower activation energy. So if you add an iron catalyst, and remember the iron catalyst, It'll speed the rate of reaction up, so it speeds the forward reaction up, but it also speeds the reverse reaction up, so it doesn't affect the position. But what it does is allow you to make more of the product more quickly. This is your last chance to pause the video and the last activity. Have a go through this activity with a drag and drop. Don't forget the arrows on the screen to go all the way down through the questions to make sure you're happy with the harbour process. I recommend having a go at the stages of the harbour process and the interactive activities after you've watched the click view video which I've sent you in the email. The very best of luck to you. You have to know these words as part of your notes. Enjoy watching the other video and learning from the book. I'll see you soon.